Hello boys and girls, Greg from the Scary Spirits Podcast here to make you another cocktail. This week's cocktail is called the Sour Feet Cocktail, which is the featured cocktail in today's episode. All right, we're going to start with our highball glass with ice. To that, Jägermeister. About half an ounce Jägermeister. Next, gin. About half an ounce of gin. Recipe calls for 20 milliliters, which is approximately half an ounce. Ten milliliters, or a quarter of an ounce. Lime juice from the plastic lime. Then, top it off with Sprat. And there you have it. The Sour Feet Cocktail. Not bad. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy the podcast. See ya. Love can make you do crazy things. So can running from the law. In this week's episode of the Scary Spirits podcast, The Unknown, these two paths collide in the most disastrous of ways. Extreme doesn't even begin to describe the results from decisions made for love and prison avoidance. My advice? Thoroughly think through any and all of your possible mutilation choices. Cheers! Welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So, if you're ready, let's go. Hi, I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast, the podcast that combines the two very different yet highly compatible worlds of scary films and alcoholic spirits. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed. How are you, Karen? I'm doing great. How are you, Greg? I'm doing great as well, Karen. (laughs) We're a match. Karen, I believe this week's film was my choice, was it? Was it not? It was. What did you choose for us this time? This week, Karen, I have chosen the film The Unknown from 1927, starring Lon Chaney and Joan Crawford. Why did you choose this particular film? Karen, this episode comes out on July the 12th which also happens to coincide with the birthday of Todd Browning, who directed this film. Ooh, that's a nice way to bring it around to home. He also directed Dracula, the Universal one, and lots of other famous horror movies. 
And plus, we talked about this film a little bit with Dr. Craig. Okay. Well, all good connections you've got there. Thank you, you, Karen. I'm glad you approve. You like your connections. I get all willy nilly with my selections, but not you. You, Greg, you always connect it. Do you have a drink to go with this lovely film? I do, Karen. What is it, Greg? (laughs) The drink I have chosen is called the Sour Feet Cocktail. Mmm, delicious. (laughs) Well, it fits. It does. You see what I did there, Karen? Yes, I I do. Very clever, Greg. Very clever. Thank you. Would you like to know how to make it, Karen? Absolutely. So we're going to need 20 milliliters of Jägermeister. How many? 20 milliliters. 20, okay. Which is approximately half an ounce. All right. 20 milliliters of gin, another half an ounce. 10 milliliters of lime juice from the plastic lime. So that's a quarter of an ounce. And Sprat. We're going to put all the liquor and the lime into a highball glass with ice, Karen. And then we're going to top it off with the Sprite. And then we're going to enjoy. Excellent. So it's only one ounce of alcohol. And about seven ounces of Sprat. (laughs) (laughs) Just my kind of drink. It's the way I like them. It is. Quite refreshing. For being called the stinky feet. Sour feet, Karen. Oh, sour sour feet. feet. Sorry. It doesn't have a very appealing name. Should we give our listener time to make their own cocktail, Karen? Of course. Pretty, Pretty simple one. All right. Hold on. And we're back. Yes, we are. Hi, Karen. Might you have a brief synopsis of this film for us? I do. Go on. Tell me a story from 1927. On the run from the law, Alonzo hides in the circus as the armless wonder, a performer who uses his feet to hurl knives. Alonzo actually has the use of his arms, but keeps them concealed so that his true identity remains under wraps. Meanwhile, Alonzo falls in love with another performer, Menon, who has a phobia against being touched by a man. But when the circus owner discovers Alonzo's true identity, the performer makes a tragic decision. Thank you, Karen, for that mostly accurate synopsis. It's got some accuracy in there. Gives it's, away it's, a lot. It's pretty much all accurate. It's, it's a little misleading, but whatever. <laughs> Doesn't tell the whole story, but you know, then we wouldn't need to watch the film, would we, Karen? No, we wouldn't. All right, Karen, are you ready to get into it? Let's do it. Where did you watch this film, Karen? I watched it on Amazon. You got the free seven-day trial, did you? I did. I watched it on the Internet Archives. Oh. It was on Daily Motion as well, but I started watching it there and I didn't like the music. So I said, I'm going to see if I can find a different one. And I found it on like an Internet Archive site. And it had the same music. So I was like, "Ah, screw it. I'll watch it. How long was it on that? 47 minutes. Yeah, same as mine then. Movie starts with credits, Karen. Yes, it does. And music added from 1997, I believe, is when that music was added. And it's not rated. Well, there's smoking, Karen. Yes, there is. (laughs) And probably a little bit of scantily clad for the time. Maybe. A little. A little. Not a lot. I mean, it's pre-code, I guess, but... Yeah. So the movie opens and we have words to read, Karen, because if I haven't mentioned it already, this is a silent film <laughs> from 1927. Lots of words to read <laughs> in this one. Although not every time they're speaking do the words pop up. 
No, just like in all silent films. It's pretty much the way it goes. I did see that I could read some lips, though. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. did too. A little bit. Not a, a lot, bit. but a little bit. The words that come on the screen says, this is a story they tell in old Madrid. It's a story they say is true. And apparently we're at a circus, Karen. Yes, we are. A gypsy circus. Do you know what the oldest circus is? First, where do you think it originated, the oldest circus? Because I think you'll be surprised. I'm going to say, like you want a city? No. You or a country? Do a, a country. I'm going to say China. Hmm, I would have said Russia. <laughs> the Royal Hannaford Circus is an American-based touring family circus with origins dating back to 1690. It has been called the oldest circus in the world. The family first performed as a traveling troupe in 1807. I was surprised by that. It's called the oldest circus. That don't mean it is, Karen. <laughs> okay. Well, that's that's what Google says. Okay. Do you want to know where the circus capital of the world is? Could it be Sarasota, Karen? <laughs> no. <laughs> At least not according to Google. Okay, what's Google say? Peru, Indiana. Peru, Indiana. <laughs> Known as the circus capital of the world, has been home to the Peru Amateur Circus since 1960. Seems a little suspect. Ringling Brothers and Barnum & Bailey would off-season in Sarasota. That's where they, That was their home base. Okay. So there is a big circus museum there and all kinds of shit. So actually, there was a circus that used to winter in Marymount, Karen. Oh, yeah, I do remember that. They had elephants there and all kinds of shit way back in the day, Karen. I don't remember it myself, but I, I don't reading, either. Reading We're far too it. young for that, Karen. Even Marymount you. is a town near <laughs> Cincinnati. Thanks for clarifying. All right. And then we meet in the circus Alonzo the Armless. The sensation the of sensations, Karen. The armless wonder. And we meet his assistant, Nanan. The lovely assistant. <laughs> Who is the ringmaster's daughter. So the ringmaster's Nanan gets on her little platform there and Alonzo shoots the clothes off of her, Karen, with his feet. Yeah, first, sh first he's shooting a, a gun at her. And the whole thing is turning in a circle while he's doing this also. But they're still directly across from each other. So I don't know if that makes it any more difficult or not. Still, I would be nervous if I was in the crowd when that gun was pointed <laughs> at me. That's Every true. time it went around. I agree. I didn't think of that, but that's true. And yeah, then he should. begins throwing knives after he disrobes her for the most part. Yeah, she's in boy shorts and a bikini top. He begins throwing knives at her with his feet. Yes. And everything goes fine. Yep. They're a success. And then we meet Malabar the Mighty. He's, he must be the strong man, Karen. Yes. And the ladies in the audience are very impressed with him. Because he's lifting a bar with the big round weights on it, like in old cartoons. And then he bends. Is that supposed to be a huge nail or something? <laughs> I guess. I don't and he, know. And he bends it. He looked familiar to me, but he kind of has that Tyrone Powers. He does you know, a little bit. Kinda, yeah. Um, or Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. That's who he looked like. I Errol think. Flynn look. But that's not who it is. No, but he's a good looking dude. But we should say Alonzo is played by Lon Chaney and Nanan is played by Joan Crawford. And uh, I guess Nanan's talking to Alonzo and she tells him she does not like it that men are always trying to put their hands on her. It frightens her, Karen. She really doesn't like it. She's grown to shrink with fear when any man tries to touch her. But her hands are all over Alonzo. She they seems are. fine with that. Next, we see Malabar professing his love for Nanan. And Malabar tries to get Nanan to touch his muscles, Karen. <laughs> but she recoils and 
It goes back into her little trailer there, her little circus trailer. I think it's like a wagon. Yeah. The wagons they used to have. She says, hands, men's hands. How I hate them. She's talking to Alonzo. And Alonzo's very pleased when he sees her rebuff the strong man. She is afraid she has hurt Alonzo's feelings because, you know, she's being insensitive because he appears to have no hands. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have hands. Read the room, Nanon. <laughs> but she hugs him then because she feels like she hurt his feelings. And his a little assistant is watching this whole interaction and wickedly smiling, I think. Gleefully. Yes. Kojo. That's Kojo. Kojo. Is, yes, is his name, but he's kind of watching the whole thing unfold and smiling. And Alonzo gives Nanan a shawl. It's a shawl. Yes. A very pretty one. And she's modeling it for him and looks in the mirror at it. She likes it. Kojo has to give it to her because Alonzo doesn't have any arms. So Kojo brings it in. Then her dad comes in, Karen. He's had a few adult beverages, I think. He's not happy that she is spending so much time with Alonzo. He takes the shawl from Anand's back and begins beating Alonzo. And Malabar comes to Alonzo's defense. And Alonzo was smoking a cigarette with his feet. Which, how do you think he they was. did that? It was someone else's feet. Who knew how to smoke a cigarette with their feet? Because, I mean, throughout the It wasn't the movie, his legs. It, it was someone else's legs. I was going to say, Lon like, Chaney was very bendy. Like, if he's sitting <laughs> in a chair, there's someone, like, lying underneath the chair, putting their leg up through the chair. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. But they seemed pretty adept with holding a cigarette in their toes. All you got to do is hold it. I don't know if I can do We're going to have to try that. <laughs> I don't think it would be that easy to hold a cigarette in your toes. I don't know. Maybe for you. I don't know. I have long toes. So I think I could do it. <laughs> An experience with cigarettes. So maybe your toes would automatically know. It yes. looked good, though. It looked like a hand holding a cigarette but it was toes anyway it was and most I of the time it was, the it looked pretty good effect wise as well i thought but so. there were a couple of times i'm like no that's someone else's leg i can tell you know I what i mean I did, but i didn't pay him enough attention at first i thought wow he's bendy like I said, he's that's a lot of research for this role that he could do that but i did notice that joan crawford did were you distracted by the whites of her eyes they were very white. I wasn't distracted, but I did notice they were very white. Do you think they did that post-production or? I don't, don't know. know. Maybe. I mean, very white. And I haven't watched a lot of silent movies, so I can't say if that was something that was done. So Cheney did his scenes with a real life armless double. Oh, okay. Named Paul Desmute whose legs and feet were used to manipulate objects such as knives and cigarettes in frame with Cheney's upper body and face. Okay. So it was someone experienced with doing that. Apparently. It looked very natural is all. Anyway, the ringmaster does come in, the father of Nanon, and starts beating Alonso. And Alonso is defending himself with his feet, which is pretty funny. It's not funny, but it was funny yes. to me. <laughs> and then Malabar comes in and saves him. And then Nanan walks by and Alonzo notices the way Malabar looks at her. So they're both in love with Nanan. Malabar confirms that he loves her. And Alonzo tells him, well, then you need to go to her and embrace her with your strong arms. Yeah, Alonzo's... Misleading. Get all handy with her. Yeah, he's like misleading him a little bit. <laughs> she likes it when you feel her up. <laughs> Put your hands on her. Every woman likes that, especially if you don't ask first. That is what she would like. So next we see Alonzo's, I call him the male servant, Kojo. Kojo. <laughs> Begins undressing him, and we see that he indeed has arms, Karen, and he keeps them 
tied to his body with some sort of like girdle thing. It's right? a corset. Corset. Yeah. Yep. He shakes out his arms as you would if your arms have been plastered to your body all day. But he has one little, what would you say? Anomaly. (laughs) Yes. Distinguishing characteristic, perhaps. He has two thumbs on his left hand, Aaron. There you go. A double thumb. And we learn that he is hiding from the police. He's in trouble with the law. Next, we see the circus owner again, who's Nanan's father, right? Yeah, Alonzo and Kojo are out and about on the circus grounds, and they run into the ringmaster, who's the father of Nanan. I think his name is Zanzi, something like that. Something like that. But he gets in Alonzo's face. Yeah, his last name is Zanzi. Oh. Um, And he pulls the shawl off of Alonzo and finds that he indeed has arms. And they fight. And Anon looks out her window just in time to see Alonzo strangle her father. But she can't tell that it's Alonzo because she can only see the back of the man. But she does see the man's two-thumbed left hand. Yes, she does. The police arrive, Karen. I said, are the circus people burning the ringmaster? What's happening there? They're all in a circle around a fire, and it looks like they're burning him. But it, I think they're burning his clothes. There was something about burning the clothes to keep the souls out of hell or something. Yeah, something like that. But the police are there, and everyone in the circus has to be fingerprinted except Alonzo. He's playing yeah. a guitar with his feet at that point point and we also learn that there have been robberies that have occurred everywhere the circus has traveled in every town so they're pretty sure it's someone in the circus is committing these crimes circus leaves town karen but nanan and alonzo stay behind alonzo smokes a marlboro with his feet and explains that he wants to take nanan away from the things that she hates he also says he promised her father that he would always take care of her. But she wonders if they're going to sell the circus to pay off the debts that her father has accumulated. Malabar arrives with flowers and again professes his love for Nanan. Again, he tries to hug her. And she recoils. And he leaves. says he loves her always. Nanan hugs and kisses Alonzo. On the cheek, we should say. She yes. does kiss him on the cheek, but he is just overwhelmed by that. Kojo warns Alonzo that if she hugs him like that again, she may feel that he has arms. Yeah, that's what she's going to feel. <laughs> when she hugs him like that, it's going to be his arms. Okay. Well, what else would it be, Karen? I don't know. Alonzo says there is nothing that he won't do to have her. Nothing. Nothing. I must have her. He's a little obsessed. Next we see Nanan back at her room, and apparently Malabar has snuck in and is waiting for her, Karen. (laughs) Nothing weird about that. Did you see that now? At least he's not a peeper. (laughs) No, he's a stalker. He's right in the room. They're shooting through linen now. Did it change in yours back and forth between a linen texture and a non-linen texture? It was weird. I don't know what that was. It wasn't day and night. It wasn't inside, outside. It wasn't room specific. It it was weird. And I wrote that uh, Nanan seems to like Malabar. She does. She just doesn't like his hands. (laughs) Yes. Because he says, you're a riddle to me. You shrink from me, yet you kiss my flowers when I am gone. I said, why doesn't she just tell him what her problem is? Well, right here, he kind of figures it out because she is staring at his hands and he says, oh, I know now what what you're afraid of. And she does nod. And then he says, you will always find me near you. Always, always waiting, loving and hoping. I'm like stalking. (laughs) Alonzo tells Kojo that he must have Nanan again. He must marry her. 
And Kojo says, no, on your wedding night, she will see that you have arms and hate you. Alonzo says, no, no, she will forgive me. <laughs> Kojo reminds him that she saw the man with two thumbs strangle her father. She's going to put it all together, I think. Well, this upsets Alonzo, so he wipes his tears with his toes. Literally, no tissue or anything. It's just the toes. And he puts a cigarette in his mouth with his foot and lights it with his foot. Kojo laughs at him because he does all this, even though his arms are free. And then I said, does he have an idea that he's going to cut off his arms? This is where he starts to look like he's going to do that. But yes. he doesn't have to do that. He could just cut off his thumbs. I mean, the whole point is he strangled the dad with two the two thumbs or just take off one of the thumbs. The the argument is she'll forgive you. He thinks he'll be forgiven for lying about the arms. But Kojo says, but she saw a two-thumbed man strangle her father. So just take one of the thumbs off. But no. Go on. <laughs> that never occurred to me, Karen. I don't know. Maybe I just think that You're overthinking it. <laughs> no, less <laughs> less is better. You don't you don't have to do this extreme stuff. Okay. But he's all about the extremes. So what happens? And then we see a note, apparently, that says, leave the door to the operating room open and be there at midnight alone. Remember Algiers 20 years ago. Yes. Hello, boys and girls. Thanks for listening to the Scary Spirits podcast. Karen and I really have a great time putting these episodes together. If you enjoy what you hear, please consider taking the time to leave a review wherever you listen. Reviews really help independent podcasts find listeners. The more listeners we have, the easier it is for people to find us. Now, back to the show. And we cut to an operating room. It's kind of like one of them university operating rooms, Karen, where everybody can sit and watch around, right? That's what it is, yes. And the doctor wants to know who Alonzo is. He shows him his hand with two thumbs. And apparently he's got something on the doctor because the doctor thinks he's going to blackmail him for money. And Alonzo yeah. tells him he wants him to amputate his arms. And he warns that he has left a letter exposing the doctor that would be, you know, released if something happens to him. If he should happen to pass away during the surgery, Karen. Yes. Be careful I do not die in this operation because I left a letter telling who you are. I thought that was smart, <laughs> you know, covering all his bases there. And we see Nanan and Malabar walking by the river. I said, she's going to go down the steps, trip, and he's going to catch her. And what happens? <laughs> well, Karen, she trips and falls, I wrote. <laughs> On the steps. And Malabar catches her. He quickly puts her down. After they stare at each other. And puts his arms behind his back, Aaron. But she realizes maybe that wasn't so awful. Maybe and immediately, <laughs> I am not afraid anymore, Malabar. All my foolish fears are gone. All it took was one little tumble on the stairs, one good catch, and everything's great. And we see Alonzo in his hospital bed recovering. Doctor tells him he should be able to leave in a few weeks. So I looked that up. How long does it take to recover from an amputation? It's a lot shorter than Well, I did you look it up in 1927 or <laughs> No, I did not. But he said a few weeks and it's Oh, four they did eight, it all the time in the Civil War in the 1870s. Four to, eight, four to 8 weeks for the the wound to heal, you know, and then the scarring takes a little longer and now we have rehab and prosthetics. So well, he don't need any of that shit because he's used to using his feet anyway. Right. So I'm just saying, just it was shorter than I thought. I just thought it would be a lot longer than that. And we see Nanan and Malabar planning a wedding, Karen, apparently. But she would like to wait until Alonzo comes back so that he can be there. Yes, how thoughtful. They're very happy. Alonzo arrives home, Karen. Or I think he goes to see Nanan. I can't tell if he's at his house or Nanan's house. Well, I Whatever. thought it was the same one. I thought they were in the same apartment. Okay, maybe they are. But she ain't there. 
No, she's at the theater, the landlady yeah. says. He sends Kojo to the landlady to see if she knows where she is. And cut he drinks to... some wine with his feet. <laughs> and we cut to Nanan in Malabar, and Nanan finds it odd that she has not received a letter from Alonzo while he has been gone. So Co- I also, before you go any further, I thought Lon Chaney looks a lot older. I mean, Joan Crawford's only 18 in this role, and Lon Chaney was 44. So we talk, you know, a lot of the films today, people talk about how much younger the female is than the male. It's been like this forever, apparently. He looked older. He did look older. You know, and Malabar doesn't look that much older. I didn't look up his uh, age, but they looked like a much better match. He looked maybe in his late 20s, I would guess. He was 33 years old, Karen. Okay, still significantly older. So Alonzo goes to see Nanan. At the theater. Apparently, they are putting together a show. Nanan and Malabar. Nanan hugs and kisses him again on the cheek. She's so happy he's returned. But she says, your body feels different. You're thinner. Have you been sick? Do you know what he says? Do you remember? He says no, but he has lost some flesh. (laughs) Yes. This is so extreme, but okay. And then she says something weird. She says, how is Kojo? I know you love him the best of anyone, don't you? Yes, she does. And then she says, I'm happy you have returned, Alonzo. Now we can be married. And then Alonzo finds out it's Malabar who she intends to marry. And I wrote, he smiles through his pain, Karen. Yes, he does. It is not a pretty smile, is it? And she goes over, remember how I used to be afraid of his hands? She says, not anymore. (laughs) You know, in the original script, he kills the doctor and Kojo, too, before he goes back home. Oh, really? Yeah, but that never never made it in the final film. But I just realized that we don't see Kojo anymore. (laughs) After You're you're right. (laughs) Nanan explains she is no longer afraid of his hands and that she loves them now. Yes, she does. <laughs> and Alonzo starts losing his shit. <laughs> he begins laughing hysterically as Malabar gropes Nanan, Nanan as yes. he watches. <laughs> Malabar says, I did what you told me to. I took her in my arms. <laughs> but then Alonzo starts crying and yes. they both notice his demeanor has changed. He collapses, and they both rush over and catch him. And Alonzo wipes his tears with his feet. And he says, it was just something in here that stung like the lash of a whip. And he's holding his foot to his heart. Yes. And they start talking about the theater. And Malabar explains his latest trick to Alonzo that they have been rehearsing. Because I guess Alonzo asks about the rigging that's all over the place, right? Apparently, Alonzo's going to do a trick where he's bound to two horses one on each arm and they're running in opposite directions and on treadmills yeah trying to pull him apart but of course they're on treadmills so they don't really pull him at all right but alonzo wants to know what happens if the treadmills broke or stop suddenly malabar says then i would be ripped in two (laughs) my arms would be torn apart they would tear my arms from my body and then you can just see the big light bulb go off in Alonzo's head. Ping! All right, Karen, next it's showtime. Got a crowd there. This is the first time they've done the trick, I believe, because they say they've been rehearsing for weeks and nothing can go wrong. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, they have a guy over there with, you know, running the brake on the treadmill and he'll be sure that nothing happens. Exactly. <laughs> so showtime, got a crowd of people in there. Nanan and Malabar exchange air kisses because she's up on a platform kind of, and she's going to whip the horses to make them go faster. Malabar straps his wrist to the horses and the horses run on the treadmills as Nanan cracks a whip from up above them. Alonzo creeps over to the lever that controls. Well, he watches all this from, you know, the side of the stage and, He goes over to the treadmill operator and sits next to him and says, Hey, I was going to give Nanan her row, but I can't reach it. Could you possibly go get it for me? So the brake man 
whatever treadmill operator goes into, I guess, Nanan's dressing room to get the robe. And while he's in there, Alonzo locks him in with his feet. It looked like his hand. <laughs> but yes, he locks him in. And he goes to the treadmill brake and begins to lean back on it, pushing it so that it begins stopping. He And he's smiling maniacally as he does it. And I thought, this is getting dark. The treadmill stop and the horses rear up, or at least one of them does, at least. Yeah, they're pulling pretty hard on his arms now because, you know, there's no treadmills at this point. And the non runs down from her perch up there and... She's trying to stop the horse. Stop from this horse. It's the, the horse that's like rearing up and, you know, kicking and everything, trying to stop it. We should say at some point, Malabar says he can't get out of the rig even if he wants to. The way his wrists are tied in, he can't just let go. They There's no way for him there to do no that. There is no emergency release. No, there is not. <laughs> so he can't just unstrap from the two horses. There's no way for him to do that. So Nanan is trying to stop the horse from pulling, and it rears up. And Alonzo runs in to prevent Nanan from being hurt by the horse. And in doing so, he is trampled by the horse. He go. Then we have words to read, Karen. More words. Lots of reading in this film. Yep. It says, so for Alonzo, there was an end to hate called death. That's all I said. It says, Karen, there was more oh, no. to it though. <laughs> okay. And for Anon, there was an end to hate called love. Yes. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> and we see Malabar and Anon once again, professing their love and embracing the end. It was a real uplifter, Greg. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I'm glad you enjoyed it. All right, Karen, anything you were pleasantly surprised by or really enjoyed in this film? What did you love about this film? I thought Lon Chaney was really good. You, I thought he acted the part very well. You could see his pain. There was quite the character arc in it for him because you know he's running from the law, but somehow he's sympathetic. You know, you kind of root for him. And then all of a sudden at the end, he's pretty brutally psychotic like he's gonna let the horses rip the arms off this dude and he initiates it and instigates it so you know i was kind of feeling sorry for him because of how it all worked out with nanan but then i was like holy crap yeah he's really a bad guy he is a bad guy i mean they tell us he's a bad guy you know and he kills someone well, we don't they don't show us really except well he for, killed someone he did but and I think he killed for the love said, of his woman. But I think they said they're going to see that these strangle marks are the same as the strangle marks that were used somewhere else because of the double thumb. So I think he killed someone previously. So he's a bad dude and he proves himself to be a bad dude. So it was a little bit of an emotional roller coaster, kind of rooting for him and then not. It was an interesting story. I was entertained. What about you? What did you like about it? I also thought the acting was very good. I liked the story in general, just the whole the plot of it. I thought it was intriguing. <laughs> it's a little bit like the is it the, the gift of the magi, magi, where they each sell. It's only one sided, but you know he cuts off off his arms to be with her, and then she decides she doesn't really hate hands anymore. Isn't it the gift of the magi where they sell? Oh no, Karen. It's a book where they sell. Not familiar with that, Dr. Karen. They each want to get each other a gift and they sell their most precious possession to get the other a gift. And the gift that they buy is related to the gift that was sold by the other. Like if it was a fiddle, the one bought, I can't remember if it, it's a violin or something and they buy a bow, but they sold the fiddle to buy, you know, so he chopped off his arms so he could please her and then she loves hands. <laughs> So a little devastating there. Yes. Anything else you really enjoyed? No, I think the acting in the story, that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, it's short. I mean, it's only, what, 47 minutes, something like that. It took some good twists and turns. What didn't you like about it, Karen? 
Well, I didn't think he had to cut off his arms. Like I said, I think he could have just cut off one of his thumbs and been okay. I mean, you know, it's only 47 minutes long. So, but it's only like one skinny second where she is phobic about hands and then all of a sudden isn't, which is probably need therapy for that to make that work. But it's Hollywood. So I don't know. I didn't really not like it was it was good. He's a little drastic in his decision making. That's all. What about you? Anything you didn't like? Well, I didn't even think that, you know, all I had to do was cut off his thumb and he'd be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get. So I don't like that. I feel stupid now. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did. They did wear gypsy costumes. Like even when he was recovering in his um, hospital bed, he still had his gypsy scarf around his head. They were pushing that a little hard, which... Well, I think they did that to make him look not so old. Oh, maybe. You couldn't tell if he had hair if he was fucking bald. You didn't. There's nothing in the film that really bothered me. I mean, I don't... I mean, Your age difference was a little odd. I don't get why she's afraid of hands or whatever, or arms or something, but, you know, she's... um, I'm reading about it, and the thing I'm reading says that she harbors a neurotic phobia or an obsession... Yeah, that just miraculously Hysterical goes away. Hysterical revulsion to the embrace of a man's arms. Sounds like she had some childhood trauma. Yeah, and it says it might have been instilled by her pathological father, the ringmaster. But whatever, I don't know. Well, yeah, in 47 minutes, you can't really explore much. But all of a sudden, she's cured because she trips on the steps is a little bit, you know, trite. But, you know, whatever. Well, she, she likes it. She likes it. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Anything else you didn't like? No. I would have liked to have seen it with the original music. The linen over the lens was a little odd too. Or I don't and I don't know if that was added later or not. I will say I didn't like that that effect. I don't know what what that purpose was. And it was weird. It sort of made them look like they were in a painting or something. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything about why they did that, but And it was random. I just felt it was unnecessary. I didn't hate it. So I think it might have been a film of a film because this movie was considered lost for a long time. Oh, okay. So I think that might have been filming them showing the film on a curtain or something. You know what I mean? I guess that's possible. Oh, I guess. But it was only And then sometimes. piecing it all together oh. to make a complete print of the film. Okay. That could be. I'll, I'll believe that that's definitely possible. So I'm not finding anything about that. That makes sense, though. That could be. But maybe he was like shooting through a screen or a filter or something to make him soften the. Well, sometimes you do effects because they're available, not because they really should be used. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. But you could be right. All right, Karen, what kind of cocktail rating do you want to give this film? Um, I would give it, I'd give it a solid three. A solid three. Yeah. I mean, I think if it was longer, I get that it's silent and they were shorter then, but why does he have two thumbs? I think it's just the right length. I would like to know why he had two thumbs. What was his previous He was born that way. What do you mean? Why does he have two thumbs? Well, like, did his dad have two thumbs? (laughs) Is it a family trait? What was his crime before that? Why does she have such a phobia over men touching her what was the trauma there there's a lot of what happened in algiers (laughs) you know use use your imagination karen imagination but i i enjoyed it i thought he was really good yeah very good face face acting yes which i guess you do in silent films and everyone did well at it so i mean malabar was always happy Mm -hmm. yeah i thought they were all good i was impressed Three cocktails. I guess I'll go with it. Why were you going to give it a two? No. Oh. I mean, it's it's good. You know, I wouldn't have picked it. I should say I have seen it before, right? <laughs> but I had forgotten lots of things. I had forgotten about the whole two thumb thing. I forgot about that whole twist. What an odd thing to come up with. I've committed a crime, presumably murder. They're going to know it was me because of my two thumbs. Probably because if he strangled somebody, right, it would have the impression of two thumbs. But they acted like... Yeah, there'd oh, be 11, it, 11 
you know, marks. <laughs> it was a two thumbed killer. Like that was such adorable thing, <laughs> you know, but I think I'll just run off to the circus and tie my arms down. But he had such talent with his feet. So did he practice that for a yeah, while? Like that takes a lot of practice. I would you think. would think, right? So it was just to live as if you had no arms. Cause he did function pretty well. Like he had no arms. Interesting. Yes, it is. That's why I chose it, as well as being Todd Browning's birthday. It's intriguing. All right, Karen, comments on our cocktail? Do you have any comments on it, Karen? It's the kind of cocktail I like. Lots of mixer. Lots of sprat. I've been talking a lot, so. And plus, it's in a highball glass. Yeah, you're only halfway Lots through. Come sprag. on, Greg. Come on, Greg. You do better than that. Whoa, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Karen. I enjoy it as well. It's a good drink. It's just enough. I mean, the Jaeger is almost like a seasoning to it. You know what I mean? Like a flavor. Like one of those machines at the movie theater where you can add anything to your Sprite or Coke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> add some cherry, add some vanilla, add some citrus, add some Jaeger. <laughs> Whatever it's you got want. That, it's got that anise, you know. Yeah. But it's also, you know, because it got the lime and the Sprite. So it's pretty good. I don't know why that has such a horrible name. Don't either. Because you don't want to have anything that tastes like feet, <laughs> I would think. All right. Anything we learned today, Karen? Well, we learned a lot of information that might not be true, but rumored to be true what the oldest circus was. Probably a self-named circus capital of the world. How long it might take an amputation wound to heal. And what the large age difference between Lon Chaney and Joan Crawford was. You didn't even throw in any kiss reference to the circus. No, but I talked about, well, <laughs> I talked about Sarasota, you know. Yeah. And was that a reference? Marymont. And, no. Is that the I, could, I could have made it a reference to the Kiss reunion album, Psycho Circus. I could have, <laughs> but I didn't. You should have, because it was a Psycho Circus. Well, he was a psycho at the circus, in the circus. It was a missed opportunity is all I'm saying. Okay, well. Disappointed. Too bad. Right? I'll, I'll never get that back. <laughs> <laughs> Not a great album anyway, so whatever. Anything else, Karen, we learned? I don't think so. All right, Karen, next film I believe is your choice. Is it? Is it not? It is. And what film are we going to watch next week, Karen? We're going to watch the film Frogs, an eco-horror film. Frogs, you say, Karen. Any <laughs> idea when that was made? I think it was 1972, but I'm not sure. Maybe 1972. <laughs> I can look it up. I have to say, I have seen this before, Karen. Well, you're about to see it again. I remember watching this really late when probably Saturday night. It is from 1972. Yeah. Back in my youth. When you stayed up all night? Yep. Probably in the winter, Karen. Because, of course, you know, we had a fuel crisis <laughs> back back when we were younger, Karen. And we heated our house with our fireplace. And the fireplace was in the basement, Karen. Oh, really? Yeah. So usually on non-school nights, I would, in the winter, I would sleep in the basement next to the fireplace. <laughs> And watch TV. So that's probably when I saw it. Good story. I bet you did. Oh, I know I did. Plus, I could go out the back door and smoke and do whatever I wanted to if I wanted. In 1972? <laughs> oh, not 1972. Oh, okay. This was, this was the 80s, at, at least <laughs> 79. Well, we were talking about 1972. <laughs> I'd be impressed if you were going out to smoke in 1972. Karen, I'm not old enough to be smoking in 1972 <laughs> i would hope not be impressive god i could barely walk <laughs> i think you could walk well, maybe you could <laughs> i was barely out of diapers karen 72 i just did the math <laughs> all right that's unfortunate if that's true <laughs> what are you trying to say karen <laughs> all right Enough of this foolishness. <laughs> do you have a cocktail for the frogs, Karen? I do. Oh, I got to hear this. Go on. It's called the Fancy Frog Cocktail. I'm impressed. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
it's in milliliters. So you're going to need 45 milliliters of vodka, 15 milliliters of orange liqueur, Salerno is what they said, 10 mils of simple syrup, 10 mils of bitters, which seems like a lot to me. And this is an odd thing. 200 mils of ice. It's only a quarter of an ounce, 10 mils. But that's a lot of bitters because usually you just shake bitters a little bit. You know, it's a tasty full strength cocktail. You shake the vodka, the orange liqueur and the simple syrup and the bitters and you pour it over ice. It says best with lunch. (laughs) And an old fashioned glass. I prefer my cocktails at breakfast, Karen. (laughs) I probably won't add that many bitters. Well, it does say that it's in milliliters, right? How many, how much vodka did you say? 45 mils. Okay. Well, it says that makes two and 2.3 standard drinks. So you should probably, we should probably half it. (laughs) Oh, come on. You can do it. Oh, I can. (laughs) Oh, I can. And I will. (laughs) I have no doubt. I mean, but you're putting it in an old fashioned glass, which is only, you know, that's true. Yeah. You might seven ounces. have it. So yeah, it's going to make a couple drinks. All right, Karen, I look forward to having that drink while we talk about frogs. <laughs> Anyone you need to thank this episode, Karen? Well, I'd like to thank our listener. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Thanks for spending time with us. What about you, Greg? Who do you need to thank? I need to thank the band Verse 13 once again for providing all the music on the Scary Spirits podcast. The music definitely makes the podcast better. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Thanks so much for listening. Want to keep in touch? Check out our website, scaryspirits.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scary Spirits Podcast. Find us on YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email us at info at scaryspirits.com. To help us grow the podcast, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You know, we really do appreciate your support. And as always, please drink responsibly. Thank you.